One of the double-edged swords of making videos on the internet is that these videos can live on forever. And so in this video, I wanna tell you about five harsh truths that I've had to deal with, if not to help you avoid them entirely, at least to let you know that you're not alone and that other people have gone through them as well. And do me and everybody else watching a favor and please leave your own hard-earned lessons in the comment section below. Number one is be curious, not angry or afraid. So I grew up an angry young man, no doubt about it. So my father bailed on my sister and my mom and I uh, when I was about 13 or 14 years old. So I, I was really just an angsty, angry young kid. A lot of people who know me probably wouldn't think that because I'm relatively low key now. And back then I kind of was too, but I had a lot of inner anger that uh, lived inside of me. Now add to that, that when my father took off, my mother was a hairdresser. So we really were living on a shoestring budget. And I live in a particularly affluent area of Connecticut where a lot of kids were getting BMWs for their first car on their 16th birthday. No doubt, I mean, seriously, this happened a lot. Kids would get these cars and not only would they, they get a car from their parents, like a BMW or Mercedes, Usually that weekend they would get in an accident and then it would either be fixed or they'd have a brand new one within a short amount of time. I didn't even get my first car until I was 19 and that was an 84 Cavalier with a million miles on it that was like a third rate hand-me-down. But I, honestly, I was kind of psyched to have that car. So I saw most of my classmates and friends living the life that I wanted to live and sort of thinking that it was out of reach for me. Matter of fact, when it came time to go to college, they were off going to their schools of choice. And although I got accepted to a few, unfortunately, when we saw the finances, uh, it just wasn't in the cards, you know, without going into a mountain of debt. And that a choice which might have been fortuitous in, in retrospect. So as that old Charlie Daniels song goes, the rich man goes to college and the poor man goes to work. So I went to work. I went to work down at an auto shop where I learned mechanics and body work and towing, got my class A. But honestly, I was just angry. I was pissed. All my friends were off telling me about the people that they were meeting, the things that they were doing, the things that they were learning in different places in the country. And here I was in the same old town working at an auto shop. And the way I dealt with that anger is that I went to the gym, I played in a metal band, and I rode my Harley with people who I you know, maybe shouldn't have been riding with. So sometime in my mid-twenties, I realized that the path that I was going down was not getting me what I wanted out of life, and it looked like the trajectory would never get me there. I didn't have high ambitions. I mean, I didn't want to live in like a huge mansion or anything. I just wanted a particular life that wasn't in the cards for me at the, the rate I was going. So I went and I saw a therapist, uh, and she told me something that changed my life, and that was to be curious rather than angry or afraid. Because back then I saw things as very binary. Everything was either a, a, a circumstance which could be taken advantage of, or it was a threat to be eliminated. It was very black and white. That's the way I saw things back then. And the way she described it to me was, as soon as you get angry at something or have like a feeling of, of you know, you wanna reject that thing. Instead of doing that, be curious, look into it. Maybe it's not for you, that's totally fine. But at least you know. And I gotta tell you, it took me a while to implement this into my life, to really internalize it and put it into practice. I still struggle with it to this day. I will not dance. I don't like dancing. I danced at my wedding and that's it. Maybe at my daughter's wedding, but that will probably be it. You know, the idea of being curious has really taken me a long way. I have done things I never thought I would do. I've gone to places that I never thought I would go. And as a matter of fact, if I had never followed that, I would have never started this YouTube channel. So, I mean, you know, I mean, everything from doing yoga to meeting people, it, it's really expanded my world a lot. It's opened up doors that I didn't realize were even closed. So truly, it pays to be curious, not angry or afraid. Now, speaking of hard earned lessons, please do not let taking care of your skin be one of them, which leads me to today's sponsor, Teach Handling. You've heard me talk about them before, and you're gonna keep hearing me talk about them because I know the positive impact that their products will have on your life. Seriously, I still don't think some of you believe me when I tell you how much implementing a quality skincare routine will improve your confidence in all aspects of your life. Teach Hanley makes taking care of your skin uncomplicated. They provide you with all the products you need and nothing that you don't. I recommend that you start with their level one system, which comes with all the basics, a daily face wash, an exfoliating scrub, an AM moisturizer with SPF 20, and a PM moisturizer. 
Oh, and to make it dead simple for guys like us, they provide this instruction card in each box that tells you when to use each product, how much to use, and in what order. It definitely comes in clutch. Skincare wasn't always something I took seriously, but now that I have, I wish I would have started sooner. But you don't have to just take my word for it because they have over 5,000 five-star reviews from customers around the globe. In addition to Amazing Skin, members of Tiege Handley get tons of benefits, including at least 20% off the retail price, access to exclusive monthly deals, pause or cancel at any time, and free U.S. shipping. And because Tiege Handley is sponsoring today's video, they're offering my viewers a great deal. Just click the first link in the description and you'll get 30% off your first box plus a free gift. Don't miss out on this amazing deal. Click that link and get started today. Okay, lesson number two, life is rarely fair, but you always have options. Now, as that guy working at the auto shop, seeing the life that I didn't want to live, and you know, seeing what all my friends were doing, I, was, I felt left out. I really did. I felt like there was nowhere to go. And to be fair, I totally just wallowed in self-pity for probably too long. And I remember thinking to myself, Jesus, man, I'm 24. I'm too old to start anything over again. Can you, I mean, looking back, 24, 24. I was too young to start doing something else. Come on. So it, it really took me a few, a long time. I can't even think about the, the duration, but after a while I realized that, look, nobody else is gonna change my situation but me. I mean, if I don't like where I'm going, I have nobody to thank but myself. Despite the, the circumstances surrounding me, I always have options and I'm the one driving this damn ship. So what am I gonna do? And it was after a day that really sucked down at the shop that I realized, man, I don't want to do this anymore. I remember exactly what I was doing, if you care to hear. I was breaking a tire bead on a truck tire, which you basically have to put these things on the ground. We have a, a sledgehammer with this kind of duck bill on it, right? And so what you, you do is you aim that duck bill right for the bead of the edge of the tire. Once you break that bead, you can use crowbars to, to break it down. And it's, it's very challenging work. It's, it's pretty heavy stuff. I mean, those truck tires are not light. There's no doubt about that. But I'm doing that and I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm 24 years old. I don't want to do this when I'm 44 or 54 or God knows if I even make it to 64. I looked at the guys who I was working with and although they were in their 40s, they looked like they were in their 60s. And so that's not the life that I wanted. That night I drove right after my shift. I drove right to the tech school. On the way there, I decided that I wanted to be an electrician because I remember going through the whole process. I'm going, okay, well, um, I'm 24. I live on my own. I can't afford to pay for college. I can't just stop and go to college full-time, get a four-year degree. How long would a four-year degree take me to, to go at night? We're talking eight, 10 years down the line. I'm not sure I can do this. Then I'm 34. I mean, how am I going to start a career then? So my other option was the trades. I knew I needed some kind of post-secondary education. And I decided on the way there that I didn't want to be deaf by the time I was 30, which is a lot of tin knockers and stuff and I didn't want to deal with uh, wet plumbing stuff and toilets. So that was as simple as my process was. On like the 15 minute drive, I decided the rest of my life pretty much. Got there, signed up to be an electrician. The rest is history. It's a, it's a career that I'm still in to this day and uh, have spent about um, almost, what's it, 17 years in, if my math is correct. Math has never been my strong, strong, strong suit. So even though money was tight, even though I had a job that paid me $11 an hour at that time. And even though all of my friends had different opportunities that I was not, that just weren't you know, in the cards for me, I still had options. And as a matter of fact, looking around now, after all this time has passed, I'm doing better than most of my friends who did go to college. Now, there is an argument to be made for the trades versus office work, uh, blue collar versus white collar there. That's not what this video is about. But the lesson is, no matter how badly things suck, there's always an option. There's an option to do the next best thing you can do. And then from there, you will have options and you keep climbing that ladder no matter how arduous it is because it's a climb worth making and there's no time to start that's better than today. Lesson number three, some people will try to keep you down. And unfortunately, some of those people will even pose as your biggest cheerleaders. Not everything is as it seems. And unfortunately, this is something that I think you know, as an idyllic younger person, we look at life and we go, you know, everything is kind of the way it looks. People who say something, they mean it. Nobody lies, right? And, and you unfortunately have to learn that damn fact the hard way. This was one that was extremely difficult. So when I was deciding to leave the mechanic industry, 
which is a cool industry. And I think that there's other options there as well. But when I decided to leave, the people who were at that shop did not like that at all. Now, I would have thought that people would say, hey, you know what? Good for you. You know, you're young. Try something else. This, this trade sucks or whatever, okay? They, a lot of them, some of them did. Most of them didn't. Most of them were like, what do you think? You're better than me? You might as well just leave your toolbox where it is because you're going to be back in a few months. Why do you want to go and twist wires together? You're going to get killed on the job. Well, all number of different things. People did not like the fact that I was moving on. So I eventually did. It took a while, you know, it took a while to get past that. But eventually, I, you know, I got accepted to the apprenticeship program, did my whole apprenticeship. I did about eight years with one company. And so I went from an apprentice to a foreman uh, or to a journeyman. And I was leading a, a small group of guys. And I remember at that point, I was, you know, asking the owner of the company. I said, hey, you know, what's next? What is next in this trade for me? Past leading more men and becoming like a super or something like that. What, what's the trajectory? What's the kind of career path here? And he said, no, there, there kind of is none. You are where you, you really need to be. And, and unless you really want to own your own company, which I don't think you want to do, uh, you, you might as well just stay here because it doesn't get much better. Now, uh, that was complete BS. That was absolute just garbage. And uh, I got mad. And what I did is I actually ended up emailing the, the heads, the big, if you had a C in your title, CEO, COO, C. FO, any of that stuff, I emailed all those people of the biggest electrical contractors that I could find saying, I'm not looking for a job, but I'm just looking for some career advice. One guy got back to me and I ended up sitting across from that guy several years later in a job interview. <laughs> Pretty interesting. So anyway, the guy who I had worked for didn't want me to move on. He was, he just, just he didn't have my best interest at heart. He saw that he had a good worker and he didn't want to lose him, which I understand, but he didn't want, didn't want me to move on. So Sometimes, even though people might be telling you that they think you're great, they think, you know, you're, you can do this, blah, 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 um, they often have their own interests at heart. So, unfortunately, not everybody's going to be your cheerleader, and some people are going to try to keep you down. Number four, build yourself a council of advisors. Now, as I mentioned, I was an angry, aggressive young man, something that I've let go of for the most part. And uh, one day, I got a call from somebody who told me that a so-called friend of mine had really, really betrayed me in a way that was very, it cut, it cut very deep. All right. So being the aggressive guy I was, I called this guy up and I said, Hey, uh, I heard what you did and I'm going to come and find you right now. And I'm going to beat your head in with a baseball bat, which I was actually pre very prepared to do at the time. And, uh, I say that with no pride, by the way, that's a foolish thing. The guy who can't maintain hold of his emotions, uh, is, is pathetic. And, and I, that's, that was me at the time. So I left uh, and I had my baseball bat and I'm driving to my truck trying to find this guy going to his work, going to his house. And my phone is ringing, ringing, ringing. I didn't realize that this guy had called the cops as soon as I got off the phone with him. My phone's ringing, ringing, ringing. And it's a guy. So as I mentioned, we used to tow and I was friends with a lot of cops. This was a guy who worked at the police department. I won't say his name, although he's retired. And he said to me, hey, drive to the back of the mall right now. Don't do a thing. Don't make a phone call. Get there right now, immediately. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So I did. I drive back there. It's an abandoned parking lot. It's just me and a cop car. And uh, there he is. And he comes out. And he's just like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I'm like, just, just fired up. I'm telling him about this guy. Tell him about what he did. Tell him about how I'm going to make things right. Yada, yada, yada. You know, big tough guy, right? And, uh, and he, he very calmly told me his own story of a situation that was kind of similar and and we actually had a pretty good talk. And what he left me with was, hey, look, you know what? People like this, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot eventually. They don't need you to help, okay? They're going to bring themselves down. So don't let them drag you down with them And when it inevitably happens. So after that, I calmed down. He's like, you know, I got the call. Um, you're an idiot. Go away. Do me a favor. Never talk to this guy again. And so I said, okay, <laughs> not a problem. So as I mentioned, my father bailed and really had nothing to do with us past a certain point. And uh, I started to find masculine influence in other people. This guy was one of them. And, and this was one of those people who was there to talk sound advice into me when I needed it most. And so over time, I started sort of gathering father figures, you know? I mean, I had a friend who was an accountant who I would listen to for financial advice. 
Um, my uncle, who was a, a great tradesman, and I would talk to him about work ethic and career opportunities and all that kind of stuff. There was people who I would talk to, and, and I would trust them because they were experts in their field. And you don't necessarily need to have one person who can do it all. You can, you can build a council of advisors, people who you trust in certain aspects, maybe not in others, but they know what they're talking about in one particular aspect. And that is your council of advisors. The bigger that is, the more trusted and the, the better these people are, um, the better off you will be. So I hope that in a way, indirectly, I can hopefully be that for you when it comes to choosing great products. But, uh, you know, for me, I had plenty of people, my drum teacher, Rob, uh, many people who were there to help me when I needed it. And when I needed particular advice in a very specific area of life, I had people who were a bit of a sounding board. And that kind of thing, this council of advisors is so valuable. No man is an island. No woman is an island. You can't go through this whole thing alone successfully. So the more people you can bounce ideas off of and get their opinion and people whom you trust, the better off you're going to be. I really don't know what to title this last uh, lesson, but I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the story anyway, because I think that there's something there. So I took drum lessons from a guy named Rob. Rob's a very accomplished drummer. You can look up Rob the Drummer online here, and he's you know he has a, a list of, of accolades, I mean, a mile long. He had played in bands with my father back in the 70s and 80s, and uh, you know he, he gave me drum lessons from junior high school well past uh, my, my graduation of high school, so like into my mid-20s. And honestly, the lessons with him were more, I mean, they were just as much about drumming as they were about life philosophy and discipline and all those things. I really almost look at it as more of a martial art kind of thing, uh, just because of his method of teaching. It was very, very, very interesting. So uh, sometime, I think, when I was maybe a freshman in high school, Rob asked me if I would be interested in mentoring a kid named Ben. He was sort of troubled. He came from a rough household. He had potential, and Rob saw it and thought that this could have kid could have maybe used a little bit more help. And so he thought I was the guy for the job. Now, Ben was in junior high. I was in high school. I think we had three or four years between us, something like that. And so I actually, I had him over. I, he, I, he called me up, which I was surprised that he called me up. Hey, you know, Rob gave me your number. What do you think about, you know, kind of starting some sort of mentorship, which took some stones. So I, I give the kid credit. He came over, we, we played drums. We, you know, hung out and stuff. And it was cool. It was like a big brother, little brother situation. I really enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, for his uh, junior high talent show performance, I helped him put together this whole drumming sequence that he played to, like a backing track. And and so he nailed that and, and went on. But as time does and, and things happen, people drift far apart. I mean, Ben got more in involved in his life. I got more involved in my life. And you know, I think he was a freshman when I was a senior. You know, we were worlds apart. We were still friendly, but, you know, as happens sometimes, you lose touch with people. So, you know, that happens. So it was some time after graduation that I had heard that Ben had died of a heroin overdose. And uh, I did not go to the funeral. You know, I just did, like, didn't feel like there was a place that, that was a place that I should have been at all. So really when I look back at it, you know, I failed him for sure. He was somebody who needed help. And if I had maybe continued being in his life in a more active way, then things may have turned out differently. And, you know, if for some miraculous reason, uh, Ben's parents see this video. I am really, really sorry that I didn't do more. So like, I don't know what the, the real lesson here is, but I think that what's to be taken away is that despite what Disney and all these, uh, you know, movies tell us and stuff, not every story has a happy ending. You know, tragedy will inevitably come. You know, it will rain. There's no doubt about it. And sometimes that might be your fault. And, uh, you know, so when it comes to how to deal with that, I look at my grandfather. My grandfather's 96 or 97 years old. He's not even really sure what his birthday is. He was born in Poland. He had seen his, his, uh, his parents taken from him in the uh, concentration camps. They, he, he, they took his father first. They came back. They took he, his mother... And his uh, sibling, they split them up, and he never saw them again. He got out of there, went to Belgium, where he met my grandmother. You know, it, it, It's quite a story. And uh, so he's still alive to this day. Here's a guy who had seen, again, his family take it from him, lived through concentration camps, lived through working in mines, uh, has seen two of his sons die, his wife. He's basically alone now, and, uh, and you know, until, you know, except for people who go and visit him and stuff. 
But there's a guy who you would think that has every reason in the world to kind of complain and, and be like, you know, uh, life just sucks. What, what can I say? But he's not. He's not at all. When you go over there, he's all smiles. He's very, very happy. I always ask him, hey, Jaja, how you doing? Uh, as good as can as good as could be expected or something like that, you know, which is like, hey, I'm old, but I'm still here. And he's just he's a happy guy. I don't think he was always that way, but I think that that's what a long life will will allow you is some sort of retrospect. And he does tell me sometimes, you know, that that he's he's ready to go. He's he's ready to go. He's just waiting. And, you know, he's seen everybody who cares about with, you know, for the most part, die. And he's he's ready to he's ready to to cross that next uh, chapter. So even though things might be dire and things might just suck and some stories may not be uh, the ending that you want, it will absolutely be sunny again. You know, the sun will come out again. And I can't imagine what it's like to lose a child. That's like, I couldn't imagine a worse feeling than that. So uh, I'm not sure how in the world you bounce back from that. I don't think you do. I don't, I just don't think you do. So anyway, yeah, some stories have, don't have a happy ending, but it will, the sun will come out again. I don't know who needs to hear that, or if you don't at all, or if you stuck with me through this video to this point, but either way, I really thank you for watching, and I hope that something here has a positive effect on your day, your week, maybe even your life, and uh, if it does, then mission accomplished. Anyway, I'll catch you next time.